Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back to the lecture series in Animal Physiology. So, we concluded the last lecture with a very brief introduction about spatial and temporal summation in the neural networks. So, we are into the sixth week and this is the first class of the sixth week. So, here we will elaborate this further, what we exactly kind of physiological significance of spatial and temporal summation. And from there, we will move on to the different uh, pathophysiological situations arising due to irregularities or due to certain disease states of this network. So, to start off with, if you recollect the last slide, to start here, so we are into. So this is what we dealt: spatial and temporal summation. So I told you, so there are neurons which are sitting at different places in the network. So if I call this as, so just before that, put it like this. So this is continued on week sixth lecture 1. Okay. So, if this I consider as space 1, space 2, space 3, likewise and you can keep on increasing it. So, they are sitting at different places in the space, yet they are connected. right? So, the communication channel is happening like this. Say, for example, this x, or if you go with an, uh, or rather this e, the way we have, if this is excitatory, so this one is sending a signal, sending a signal to this space two, all these different three different neurons. Fine. So now, few things could happen. One is. Uh, at what time, who is receiving the signal. So, for example, the signal comes here. So, if this is the first one to receive a signal, then if this is the second one and if this signal or if suppose there is a connection something like something like this or something like this or something like this and if this is the third one. So, you see you can put certain time into it. So, for example, this one receives a signal at time t 1, this one receives a signal at time t 2, this is receiving a signal at time t 3. So, let us redraw it that will make more sense. So, suppose this is one neuron space, this is another neuron in another space. Now, it is sending signal to this so, this is neuron A, this is neuron B, this is neuron C okay, in the network and the signal transfer is always according to the direction of the arrow. Okay. Now, suppose and let us assume this one is excitatory, this one is inhibitory, this one is excitatory. Now, suppose at time t 1, this A sends a signal. So, this is excitatory, this made this one to generate a signal and this gets transmitted further down, but just imagine at time t 1, this generated a signal at time t 2, this receives a signal this 
the neuron C. But exactly at time t 2, imagine another signal which is a inhibitory signal which arrives here exactly at time t 2, this time t 2, then what will happen? Then the signal which is suppose I consider this as uh, in blue as the positive signal or excitatory signal, in red I consider this as negative signal. So, what will happen? There will be an addition of the quantity of the positive and the negative signal. So, I have been giving it a quantity, I have just given it a sign and the resultant will decide whether this neuron which is the C neuron which is an excited in neuron, whether this will transmit the signal further or not or what will be the amount of signal which will be transmitted. So, for example, I see this positive signal is 20 unit, okay, some 20 and the negative signal is say 5, then the total signal which will be transmitted will be 15 or while this one is getting excited with a slight delay this inhibitory signal comes even before it generates an action potential part of it. So, there may be slight reduction in 5 this may be like you know becomes 4. So, your resultant will become 16 likewise. So, this is the most simplistic system where I am showing you this, but just imagine if this becomes a very complex network where you have inhibitory signal, excitatory signal, self signal. So, there is something Say for example, a neuron out here, it sends part of the signal and the part it falls back on itself. So, if we have talked about synapse or the synaptic zones, synapse, there is something called otaps or you can break it as autosynapse. So, in other word a part of the signal will be fallen back. Okay. Similarly, it could have part of the signal going to the next one. Okay. So, there are millions of possibilities which could happen in a network and what we consider as behavior consciousness, these are emergent properties as they call it of the network. It is the summation of the network what makes us who we are and it is a very, very complex network and if we look at biology with respect to time. So, you will observe that the last century is the century of cellular and molecular biology. There are a lot of molecular events, cellular events which have been defined. Earlier to that it was more of a naturalist way of, so you see the gross structure and its behavior and all the kind of stuff. Okay. So, what you used to see, so the evolution of biology is like that, initially we were more, we never had the tools we are more concerned about the behavior, the overall behavior of the network. But the last century saw where we try to understand the individual function or molecular events happening at the individual nodes of the network, which includes say for example, uh, what is happening in a single neuron, what is happening in a small network like this or what is happening in a complex network like this likewise. But now, the next generation of physiologists, neurophysiologists, neural engineers, the idea will be much more to understand the holistic viewpoint. Now, we have a sufficiently good understanding about single neuron or you know couple of neurons out there, but then how these things really leads to the word what I use the emergent behavior or emergent properties that is something 
emergent properties or emergent behavior that is something which will boggle the scientist in the centuries to come. So, it will be a long journey where we will be kind of you know trying to understand these emergent phenomena. But at this point having said you this I add few other interesting details about this network. So, we have already talked about that at the synapses if this is the synaptic cleft where neurons are transmitting their signal through the neurotransmitters. So, these neurotransmitters can be either excitatory or inhibitory you have talked about it, but what is important is that these synapses where the neurotransmitters are released say for example, if this is the presynaptic terminal and this is the postsynaptic terminal my this hand the one which I am waving now is the postsynaptic terminal and this is the presynaptic terminal and they are like you know in close opposition and very close they are not in contact, but very close to each other. So, this one the one which I am waving now if this one secretes neurotransmitters and this one receives the neurotransmitters the one now which I am waving which is the post one, but this neurotransmitter has a finite residual time in that small cleft. If that residual time exceeds by some x y z reason do not worry about what is the reason at this time, then that will create a lot of trouble. Why it will create a lot of trouble just think over it just visualize what will happen. So, this one secretes at time t 1 this one receives at time t 2 and immediately this one gets excited and the signal gets transmitted along this neuron. But if this prolongs what will happen if this is an excitatory one which is getting secreted right. Say for example, just let me put it on the slides that will make more sense. So, this is the one which is sending signal and this is the one which is receiving signal. So, this is A and this is B. Now, this one generates an action potential at say T 1 and this one is supposed to receive at T 2 and this is where the neurotransmitter are released and they bind here and they open up the sodium channels and they generate the necessary action potential right to travel, but so there is a small t 2 minus t 1 a small time window when this event is happening. Now, this time window is very critical if this time window prolongs say for example, this comes as you know delta t if you have any delta t plus some other delta added to that some other small time then what will happen if this one if a is secreting your excitatory neurotransmitter then this b will become hyper excitable because it will have much more positively charged ions or sodium ions which will be getting through the voltage gated channels. Such situation could lead to a different level of activity of the network at times and at times such situation could be pathological. How? I do not know how many of you have seen this. If you have seen a epilepsy patient, the symptoms are very interesting. Whenever a epilepsy patient gets a bout, epileptic bouts, what happen you know I mean the person start all of a sudden like you know lose contact of the system and kind of start shivering and fall down. And once they regain consciousness if you ask that person 
do you remember anything what happened? They will say no, they become dizzy and kind of you know and, and there is enormous movement of all the hands, legs and everything like you know something like this. What happened exactly is from the neurophysiological perspective in the vast network say for example, if I consider something like this if this is the network, I am not drawing the individual neurons now, okay. If this is the network, I am just keeping a gap just to tell synaptic A. At certain zones of the network, there is a hyper excitability, all of a sudden for a transient period of time. So much so that the individual kind of faints out because it cannot compensate for that high metabolic activity because whenever these cells are synthesizing such a such vast amount of neurotransmitters and secreting. So, obviously for that process to happen in a fraction of a time that requires enormous amount of energy to be produced by the cells and the individual who suffers from such thing faints out. It is almost like there is another analogy by which you can understand this. It is something like uh, imagine a four way crossing like this. So, four way crossing has a rule right. So, if these ones when these one will they will go straight or they go like this or they go like this fine. Similarly, when the other party goes from this side they either will go like this, they will go like this, they will go like this. Similarly, if you are coming from the top so, something like this, something like this and or you will go straight and exactly by the same token if you are coming from this side you will go like this or you go like this. Now, synapses has to be imagined something like a four way crossing, multiple synapses at one point and one is talking to the second one, second one is talking to the third one and there is a lot of crosstalk happening without obstructing each other. It is a very interesting zone where this crosstalks are happening and one has to understand that if in a four way crossing if the traffic light goes haywire, if the traffic lights are not working there will be nothing but collision like this, like this. And just you can use this that uh, analogy to understand what will happen in epileptic bouts in the case of epilepsy. There is an hyper excitability of the system and the system goes totally haywire, but where this happens, which part of the brain is involved in it. So, as of now I have not talked to you about the demarcation line about epilepsy or the demarcation line between the central nervous system problems, peripheral nervous system problems and other accessory problems. So, let us do something, let us draw a map out here for us to proceed further which all aspects are we going to deal here. So, what we will do? We will talk about briefly we will revisit the in the light of this briefly we will revisit the stretch reflex arc which we have already started, but we have not added all the necessary components of the um, action potentials and everything. Second out here as an extension we will talk about neuromuscular junction 
in short sometimes they call it NMJ. Then we will talk about brain anatomy. and spinal cord anatomy, which partly I have already talked. There we will talk a little bit about hippocampus and related disorders, which one we have already started. We will conclude once I show you the anatomical location, epilepsy, AD or Alzheimer's disease, Alzheimer's. Then we will talk about uh, substantia nigra and Parkinson. In the spinal cord, we will talk about motor neuron disorder, which will include amyotropic lateral sclerosis or in short they call it ALS. Then we will talk about spinal cord injury and within spinal cord we will talk about glial disorders. You remember I have introduced about the glial cells, glial myelination disorders, where there will be we will talk about very briefly about multiple sclerosis. Okay. And uh, in this whole process, talking about the brain anatomy, the most emergent property or evolving property is memory and its models. In the light of whatever we have understood about uh, the process itself and while talking about this multiple sclerosis, we will devote little bit time about myelination in CNS and PNS, which is peripheral nervous system, and there we will talk about oligodendrocytes. So, this will be our map, what will be following for next few classes to conclude this part of the course. Okay. So, I will close in here. In the next class, we will continue following this map. Thank you.